That brings us now to the studies looking at the actual consumption of omega-3s in humans and the direct effects of that. And so we'll be looking specifically at how, just like we saw in that rat study, increasing the consumption of omega-3s in humans, both from fish oil and from EPA and DHA individually, increases lipid peroxidation, which of course is associated with uh, decreased lifespan, increased aging, and is generally something we would argue is a reason not to consume these things in large amounts or not to go out of our way to consume it, again, despite the association studies. And I did want to make a point here. I believe it was when I was talking with Dom, uh, if not, it might have been somebody else, but I think it was with him. He mentioned that he thinks there could be a difference between consuming EPA and DHA individually in the ethyl ester form versus consuming fish oil in the triglyceride form. Uh, maybe it was Thomas DeLauer. I don't remember who mentioned that. Uh, but that doesn't seem to be borne out in the research. And I, and I made a point here to include studies looking at both fish oil, which would be in the triglyceride form, and EPA and DHA individually. And it doesn't really suggest that it, fish oil is any better. So uh, just wanted to mention that real quick as we get into these studies. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have too much to add there. So in this first study, it's titled Mitochondria, Omega-3, and the Route of Mitochondrial uh, Reactive Oxygen Species. And this is just a kind of overview paper where they discuss this as a whole. It's not digging into, uh, it's not like a specific individual study, which we'll be getting into after, but it ha it's kind of a good summarizer. Uh, and so they state dietary intake of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids and consequently the increase in omega-3 content of membrane lipids may be disadvantageous to health because reactive oxygen species-induced oxidative peroxidation of omega-3s within membrane phospholipids can lead to the formation of toxic products. The susceptibility to peroxidation of PUFAs by ROS raises the question of the adverse effects of omega-3 dietary supplementation, in this case specifically on embryonic development and prenatal developmental outcomes. So of course, omega-3s are suggested for those you know, in, in that population, women who are pregnant. And uh, this is questioning whether it's a good idea. They then go on to state that dietary supplementation of omega-3 PUFAs is known to induce lipid peroxidation in organ and tissues of women and animal models. The consequence of PUFA supplementation is toxicity related to the end product of lipid peroxidation. Dietary intake of omega-3 PUFAs may therefore be detrimental to cellular function as the peroxidation of these fatty acids by ROS can induce the formation of toxic products, which is potentially mutagenic and atherogenic. The disturbance in the cellular redox balance and associated damage to membrane integrity and mitochondrial function has been identified as causal factors of chronic inflammation, atherosclerosis, and neurodegenerative diseases. We'll be digging into specific studies, looking at what happens when you give this group fish oil and what was the result. But this is just kind of a, an overview, looking at a handful of different studies and just sharing some general ideas as far as uh, why we might want to be concerned about things. And just, yeah, the reason I included this is because I think it's important to have that direct corroboration in the research. Yeah, I, I know there's going to be some people in the audience who are going to be like, well, there's this study that says that fish oil does this or does that, or it has, it's actually an antioxidant. And in some studies, it does show this antioxidant function, but it's not because it's not being peroxidized. What winds up right. being happening, what winds up happening is the fish oil or the omega-3 fatty acids are so liable to peroxidation that they do indeed peroxidize both spontaneously and from enzymatic processes. And then the mediators that they produce actually signal cell defense responses to minimize oxidative stress. Like they're some of the most potent signalers, they, they interact with the same gene elements that respond to uh, things like um, cigarette smoke and diesel exhaust and things along those pathways. Um, be, just in, in terms of like their, their signals of a degree of toxicity, the lipid peroxide signal mm -hmm. all of these different pathways. Now, there are some mediators that have this and that effect specifically. But in general, there's a general upregulation of a lot of the lipid peroxidation products, both from omega threes and from omega sixes, in interacting with this. The specific pathway is called the NRF two pathway. We're not going to get into that inside this specific podcast, but it's a defense pathway. So it's again, it's a hormetic response, but it's functioning through lipid peroxidation, which is just not ideal overall. Yeah. And one of the studies that we will go through here talks about the activation of PPARs and 
uh, other uh, increases in beta oxidation enzyme activity. Yep. In the same vein of this hormetic response, which we'll discuss, it's a great point, and I would recommend that anybody who is not familiar with our view of hormesis goes and checks out that series that we did and a couple articles I wrote on it as well. Because yeah, a lot of the things that we're told are beneficial happen to work very similarly to things like cigarette smoke and chemotherapeutic agents and industrial pollutants. And uh, I think that as a baseline should be something that uh, leads us to question and concern regarding using something like this as a supplement. And it's a great point, Mike. Something we talked about also in that fatty liver series, which I'll refer back to as well, where the omega-3s have the supposed benefit for lipids by you know lowering LDL, but they do so by causing oxidative stress in the liver, which actually prevents the export of fatty acids from the liver, which again, looks good on paper when your doctor looks at your labs, but it doesn't actually mean that it's something that's beneficial on the whole. So yeah, very important context. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, so it's important to know how the, this thing is working. And is it working through a mechanism that you want to optimize? Or is it the same type of deal with, it's the same type of idea with statins, right? Are we going to lower cholesterol because we, just to lower it? Or are we going to address the underlying reasoning of why it's, why it's raised in the first place? And fish oil is like congruent in, the, in that same vein or that same like way of thinking about the problem. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. All right. So uh, I'm going to go through a few of these other studies looking at lipid peroxidation as an effect of consuming increased amounts of omega-3s. And this title, uh, this paper is titled Response of Urinary Malandialdehyde to Factors that Stimulate Lipid Peroxidation in Vivo. And it states that the composition of dietary fatty acids had a major influence on MDA malandialdehyde excretion in fed animals being the highest for animals fed omega-3 fatty acids from cow liver oil, intermediate for those fed omega-6 fatty acids from corn oil, and lowest for those fed saturated fatty acids from hydrogenated coconut oil. So just pause there. MDA or malandialdehyde is a lipid peroxide product. So this is what happens when those lipids get damaged. And we're seeing increased levels of these things being excreted. So increased levels of them happening endogenously from the animals that consume higher levels of omega-3s, specifically from cod liver oil, which again, it's very important to, to consider here. We're not talking about isolated fatty acids, you know, whatever it is. We're talking about the supplements that many people are taking uh, and them increasing lipid peroxide products. We also, I think, referenced this study in that episode where we talked more about cod liver oil. Now, the next thing that was mentioned here, I think, is also very telling. So it says, fasting produced a marked increase in urinary MDA, which tended to be higher in rats previously fed cod liver oil. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, ACTH, and epinephrine administration also increased urinary MDA, further indicating that lipolysis either releases fatty acid peroxides from the tissues or increases the susceptibility of mobilized fatty acids to peroxidation. The reason why I wanted to include this, just kind of like the hormesis tangent, I mean, we've talked considerably about the problems with fasting, and I can link back to those points in an article I've written as well. But something that Dom had brought up was, well, maybe it's okay for a healthy person to have enough omega-3s uh, because they're going to be in a low oxidative stress environment, but for a non-healthy person, maybe they need to be more concerned. Now, this is despite the fact that Normally, these are recommended for not healthy people to become healthier. So uh, if that's the case, if you're, someone's already healthy, what's the point in some ways? And also, it's still huge because then you're still saying, okay, if anybody has any health issue, anything from hypertension to cancer, don't consume omega-3s. That is very different from the general narrative of consume omega-3s. It helps with everything uh, and all-cause mortality and all of that. But the other thing here is fasting increased MDA and it did so more so, so it increased lipid peroxides peroxides for every, for all groups, but it did so the most in the group fed cod liver oil. So this is not a matter where of, oh, if you're healthy, you're fine. If you're healthy, you experience oxidative stress all the time when you do your fast, when you exercise, when you do your cold thermogenesis, whatever it is. Now we've talked extensively about those things. Again, I'll reference the hormesis series and things like that. And this is part of the reason why we don't recommend intentionally inducing stress uh, for the benefit of stress itself, instead doing it for specific effects in context that makes sense, like proper amounts of exercise and things like that. But even in a healthy individual, in, and we'll actually talk about this as well in athletes in a moment, in one of these other studies, even in a healthy individual, uh, you are leaving yourself more susceptible to greater amounts of, oxidized, of uh, oxidative stress 
Anytime you're introducing yourself to oxidative stress, which is nearly always, there's you're, that stress is unavoidable. We've talked about this too in the hormesis series. And so I think, I, I think it's a pretty weak argument to say, well, if you're healthy and not experiencing oxidative stress, you're all right when just a fast or a bout of exercise or anything else will do so. Yeah. The other thing I want to mention here, specifically with both, with all these things. So what, what they're talking about here specifically, they say with adrenocorticotropin hormone epi and epinephrine administration, increased urinary MDA, further indicating that lipolysis either releases fatty acid peroxides from the tissues or increases the susceptibility of mobilized fatty acids to peroxidation. I think when you, I think there's a couple of things going on there. So first, the rats that are fed the cod liver oil have now stored these fatty acids inside their fat tissues. And so one of the functions, one of these, these hormetic pathways uh, that are induced by the polyunsaturated fats that we mentioned was PPARs. And so again, we're going to get into this in probably an entire another episode, but PPAR gamma signaling, which is upregulated by fish oil and fish li the lipid peroxides by fish oil, induce the storage of these fatty acids inside the, the adipose tissue. So it's kind of like a protective mechanism as well. What, where are all these lipid peroxides coming from? Okay, shove them in the fat tissue. And so now what winds up happening, and, and, and this goes to your point, Jay, is that when you're put under any circumstance of stress, so if you're fasting, or as an example here, you have a release of epinephrine, which you can have in exercise, which you can have in, during exam stress, which you can have if you're startled, which you can have under numerous circumstances, and it also releases an adrenocorticotropic hormone, which is the, pre, the, the signaling molecule before you get to cortisol. When you release these hormones, and then these hormones mobilize fat stores, so they basically say, hey, we need more substrate. All right, fat, pump out the fatty acids, and you start pumping out the fatty acids. If you've loaded your fat stores up with fish oil, uh, corn oil, so omega-3s and omega-6s, when they start to get liberated, now you have an increased oxidative stress because you are liberating a bunch of unsaturated fatty acids. And they're saying that they increase the, they're, that the hormones in cells are increasing the likelihood of these fatty acids to being per peroxidized. I think just liberating the fatty acids into circulation will allow them to become peroxidized because they are peroxidized under many circumstances relatively easily. But then the other thing to keep in mind is that these hormones, and we've talked about this in other episodes, drive fatty acid oxidation. And fatty acid oxidation in and of itself drives an increased ROS in the mitochondria. So you have a dual fold effect. If your tissues are loaded with polyunsaturated fatty acids, your fat tissues, and whenever you're put under any type of stress, you're going to liberate these fatty acids. Those fatty acids are going to, if they're high in, a, in, in unsaturated fats, will probably peroxidize just in the liberation process and circulation. And then they're also, these hormones are driving fatty acid oxidation, which will increase ROS as well. And then now you have an increased ROS of the mitochondria, and then you have an increased lipid peroxides and then fats that are likely to become lipid peroxides. So it's like a, it's a recipe for disaster overall, loading your tissues up on these fats. And again, the polyunsaturated fatty acids are kind of like dynamite that just hanging around. And in any type of stressful situation is going to be that spark that's going to light the fuse. So it's, it doesn't make any sense to, as you're saying, to use these to help to, for healthy people to stay healthy. If they're starting to load their tissues up of these fats, you start putting them under distress and now they're going to, their bodies are going to collapse under the, under the, the lipid peroxides and, and that are being developed from, from these different circumstances. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not a good idea. And this, the stress, and this goes with kind of like the, against the hermetic ideas is like, Fasting overnight induces the release of stress hormones, being startled, getting emotionally upset, having a workout, going for an ex a brisk walk can upregulate some of these hormones. It's not that you don't ever want to upregulate these, but to try to like constantly push for these different hormones and then load your tissues up on unsaturated fatty acids is just a terrible combination in the long run. It's how you would, I, <laughs> at least from my perspective, take a healthy person and then make them unhealthy. It is like one of the best <laughs> ways to do it. <laughs>